So yes, thank you for the introduction. So my name is Anna. I'm a second year PhD student in Fabian Teichs' group. And I work specifically on cell communication models for spatial transcriptomic data. And in the lecture, I would like to specifically introduce a tool we developed in our lab for inferring cell communication, which is called node-centric expression models. And I'll relate this a little bit to different other methods you have um, to explore cell communication, also for dissociated tissue. But this method in particular is tailored for the novelties you have in spatial transcriptomics. So as you saw throughout the course is that spatial transcriptomic is quite an important topic. And even today, together with Hannah, you explored a little bit how you can analyze these spatial transcriptomic data sets. So there are various tools out there that tailor different issues and different problems you might come across when you analyze these types of data sets. And I will now guide you a little bit through a example that is tailored around one data set you explored in Hannah's talk and Hannah's um, tutorial, which is on collateral cancer. With SquidPy or other spatial transcriptomics data analysis tools, you can now investigate the spatial distribution of different cells in their original spatial location. And this is quite nice because you can directly see, for example, from this slides, that there are epithelial cells, which in this case are cancer cells, are jointly clustered together. And they, in some cases, might form these cancer regions. Additionally, you might observe that there are also T cells scattered around these cancer cells. And now from just looking at these images, you might conclude that there's an interaction between T cells and these cancer cells. However, um, it's still difficult to assess how strong is these, this communication. Is there an, um, indeed an impact on the gene expression variation if you have these cell types close by? or are they just randomly allocated? So it's we call this that they are still latent in your observations and you need specific tools to analyze if you see an enrichment of these communication events. In this case that I specifically described, you might want to analyze what is the effect of a T cell being close to an epithelial cell. And for this specific, um, analysis step we designed um, called ENSIM for node-centric expression models. Yes. So how is this done? Um, imagine you have a spatial transcriptomic image slide, which you segmented. And from this one, you observed individual location of, of each and every cell. Additionally, with the standard SCAMPI analysis, you might have come to the conclusion that certain cells represent different cell types. So you overlaid it now your segmented cells with the annotation, and you might also have obtained a more granular annotation, like differentiated and repressed cancer cells with malignant cancer cells and additionally immune cells. So now for the STEMI example, there might be an interaction between immune cells and cancer cells, and they cause a repression of specific phenotypes in cancer cells. And you might want to analyze how strong is this inhibition of certain um, receptors, for example, or ligands, and really get to quantify the importance of these interaction patterns. What we did now, we took this graph, this spatial transcriptomic graph, which also um, Hannah potentially introduced, and said, okay, within a certain resolution, so a certain radius of one particular cell, we assume there are interactions happening. So this can be either a predefined radius that you think is plausible for the cell types you have present in the data set, or you can with Ensem investigate these interaction um, resolutions and find the best interaction distance. Within this niche, all cells with we assume that all cells are connected and there's a dependency between these niches of cells. How can we now handle this information that we observe from the graph of cells? We now take um, 
this graph of star types and we investigate what is the the com spatial composition of different star types present in these these niches and in this case we see quite clearly that there are two types of cancer cells which you want to analyze in the data set one is connected to um, a epithelial cell which we are not interested in this case and an immune cell and a different one which is only connected to epithelial cells. And interestingly, they now differ in their gene expression space. So we have a variance co composition that is dependent on the neighborhood structure. So we translate this categorical space of annotated cell types and transform it to a continuous representation in gene expression. And the nice thing about this is, as it's in the simplest case, um, a linear model, we can directly observe from the parameters learned by node-centric expression models if there is might be a repression on a certain phenotype because there's an immune cell close to a cancer cell. So the results we obtain are quite similar to the ones you could also obtain in differential expression analysis. In our case, we just related to the neighborhood structure and communication events to potentially gain some insights. That's now the theory around it, but how can we actually apply this to different kinds of spatial transcriptomics um, data sets we might have? And typically you can divide these data sets into the targeted ones and also what was Emma referring to the spot transcriptomics data. Node-centric expression models are applicable to both kinds um, of spatial transcriptomics data, which also makes them quite unique in their application field. I now first go into the targeted case where we really have single segmented cells and we want to assess what are potential plausible communication events. We tested the ENSEM framework and these linear models for different scenarios because you can have various technologies with, with which you obtained your spatial transcriptomics data set. And we, across all of those, we found that um, at certain distances, there are communication events um, observable. And what we measured here is we compared a network that only has access to cell types and explain the variation that we can observe in gene expression by these cell types. And then we added the neighborhood component to it. And what you can observe throughout these quite abstract figures is that we see a slight peak as soon as we increase the resolution and the radius of these tiny niches of communication, communication niches. And this, proves for us that there are communication events in this data set that explain some very vari um, variance in the gene expression. So this is the first step. If you have no clue about what resolution or what radius in micrometer might be a reasonable interaction distance, because this can vary across data sets. Here you can see that maybe of, um, liver, or also cancer, they have a best communication distance around 10 micrometers, which also, or 20, which also resembles a little bit um, um, intermediate cell um, size you can observe in this data sets, but some systems might um, communicate on longer distances, which you could indicate here for brain. How can we transfer this now? So this is again, the cancer data set and we see that there might be an interaction between the cancer cells and the data set and the T cells. And now we pick a certain resolution, in this case, 20 micrometers, and you can look into the parameters learned by these node-centric expression models and find, uh, we call them type couplings. These are basically now interactions that explain variants observed in gene expression. And we can now visualize them in these circular plots. And in this case, we correctly see that Ensem picked up directional dependencies between T cells and epithelial cells, and also some other cell types. This is also quite important because most interaction tools 
they are not directional. So they will give you um, a weighting of different ligand receptor pairs, but you won't get the directional effect because some cell types might only have an impact in one direction, whereas others in the other. We can all now also investigate what are really the effects on certain phenotypes. So um, disentangle these directions really on the gene level. And we observe here that um, also really important genes that are important for T cell activation show um, a positive or negative fold change on these um, variances we can observe in gene expression. We can now also compare this with tools like SquibPy, which gives you a little bit the dissociated view on cell-cell communication with um, a wrapper around cell phone DB. So this is database um, based and gives you important ligand receptor interactions. And we see here that also CD8 and CD4 are important for certain interactions and NSAM also picks them up. Um, but in a different view. Most of these database tools are limited to ligand receptor, pre-annotated ligand receptor interactions, whereas NSEM is not limited to these because you can apply it to the whole gene panel you observed in the data and um, can also identify maybe features that are um, plausible for closed surface interactions instead of only maybe ligand receptor interactions. The second step now is what you heard before is deconvoluted or decomposed visium data. In this case, it's a little bit difficult to assess communication events because you can ultimately apply all communication tools to visium spots, but this will result in spot spot communication events. And this is from just from the biological perspective not necessarily the correct way to um, think about communication because one spot can cover multiple cells and in the end you want to assess what are really cell, cell communication events and if there might be an inhibition if certain cell type is present. So what you can essentially do is you deconvolute these Visium data sets with a tool of your choice, that it be cell to location or a stereoscope, you heard a couple of them in the previous lecture. And we can now use the deconvoluted case and use this result again in the node centric expression models. The network then is a little bit different because you want to use the learned proportions and assess if there's a difference, if the proportion in a spot is different. Can we have a can we observe a variation in gene expression based on this different composition? So might there be an interaction that has an impact on gene expression on the spot level? And we applied this to a data set um, on lymph nodes, which was analyzed from cell to location before. And we also found in this case that there are directional, really strong directional communication events that also explain some local um, morphologies you can observe from histological images. So we really see that um, NSEM can identify these morphological changes that also drive um, variation in gene expression and that also relate to um, communication events you can see. I also noted that NSEM is relatively similar to results you can obtain for differential expression. So these gene effects you can observe with NSEM and the differences, we can also visualize them in a classical volca volcano plot by taking one of these interaction axes and looking into the specific features that are potential drivers for communication events. And this is um, a new way of tackling this because there are many communication tools out there. Um, one example would be NicheNet or also database ones like um, cell phone DB, which you can access via SquidPy in a quite nice um, fashion or um, also cell chat. But most of these tools are work on dissociated tissue. And from our perspective, it's important to incorporate the spatial structure 
to um, restrict you really yourself really on cells that communicate on a close distance and close proximity in space. This, if you're interested in using that, we will be um, using tomorrow some example on NSEM in the tutorials. And we also have a preprint out on bioarchive and this tool got recently accepted in Nature Biotechnology. So it will soon have a tutorial series out with it and um, some more information on how we leverage this. And I specifically also want to thank my co-authors, which is David Fischer and Fabian Theis, and also um, the people in our lab. This was a picture taken recently at one of our group hackathons. And yeah, that brings me to the end and I'm happy to take 